you're here. Let's have some fun worshiping Jesus tonight. Come on. He is worthy of our praise. Let's sing it. Come on. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. And I tried with all my might. But I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. A vagabond. And just when I ran out the road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was dying alone. Come on, hey! He picked me up and turned me around. He placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. Every morning you 
I can see so clear what it's all about So stay by my side When the sun goes down I don't wanna forget you something about the God that we sing to tonight. Some of you have heard this a lot in your life and others of you this might be the first time you've heard it. But we can all stand to be reminded of it. We sing to a God who has created you in his image. He sees you and he loves you and he is for you. He does not love you because of anything that you've accomplished but he loves you because that's who he is. He gives us a perfect love that is beyond condition. He loves you because you're His. And when we sing that His love is enough for us, that's what we're saying. That no matter the voices of the world around us, we choose to listen to the voice and find affirmation in our lives of the voice of God. So as sons and daughters of a king of a kingdom that is forever, let's just declare that together right now again. I'm already loved, come on. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen, I know who I am, I know what you've spoken, I'm already loved, more than I could imagine, and that is enough, yes it is, come on like you mean it, let's sing it together, I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. Tell him. I know who I am. Cause I know what you've spoken. I'm already loved. More than I could imagine. And that is enough. Yes, it is. And that is enough. We believe that today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray that. Amen. Thanks so much for singing with us. Y'all can have a seat today. Well, I want to welcome you all again to CCV, whether you're physically here on our campus or you're joining us online. My name is Travis Brown. I'm the campus pastor here at our Peoria campus. And, you know, growing up in the 80s, I loved playing and watching baseball. Anybody can relate to that? 
few of you. You know, there was such, such a great area. There's so many great players that, that we tried to do what they did on the field and emulate. One of the most favorite things that we did as friends is we would try to guess which professional baseball player you were based on your batting stance, okay? And there was no player that was emulated more for their batting stance in my group of friends than this guy right here, Daryl Strawberry, who, who we're gonna hear from, a powerful message from here in a few moments. But I think I, I, think I actually still, I still might have it. Say, let me see, is this, how's that? Is that all right? Not very good, okay. Although none of us, none of us could actually play like Daryl Strawberry, we love to, to try and we loved watching him play. But this weekend, we're, we're celebrating Father's Day, and I think it's pretty natural for most kids to try to emulate their dads, right? I know that was the case in my life. I would follow my dad everywhere and do what he did. I ended up walking like my dad and talking like my dad, end up listening to the same music as my dad, mostly. Okay, but I had a great dad who was easy to emulate because he poured so much of his life into me. But I do want to acknowledge that this weekend I know is really tough for a lot of people because of the memories you have or the experience that you had with your dad. But I do want to take a moment and I, I want to honor and I want to celebrate our dads and thank you for everything that you do, the sacrifices that you make and for making such a great impact on this world. Can we give our dads a round of applause? You know, us trying to emulate our dads doesn't, doesn't originate with us. Listen to what Jesus said about he and his dad in John chapter five. He says, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. See, Jesus modeled his life after his father. And one of the greatest things that I see so many dads doing is the same thing that Jesus did is that when, it's when we lay down our life for other people. See, Jesus sacrificed himself and his comfort so that we all could experience life. And that's what we remember and that's what we celebrate every single week here at CCV when we take communion together. And in a moment, as we're taking communion, I pray that you, you not only thank God for what he, he gave, but you'd also thank him for the example that he gave for how you can live your life regardless of your experience with your earthly father. Let's pray together as we get ready to take communion. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for being our perfect heavenly father, regardless of the situation we've had with our earthly father. Lord, we pray that you'd bless this time. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Hey, CCV, I am up at NAU in Flagstaff, Arizona at our high school camp, and it has been an amazing week. And if you want to know what it's like to have 4,200 students and coaches worshiping Jesus and having a life-changing week, take a look at this. Watch this. If, if you only knew the revival we're seeing in the next generation here at camp, and it's possible because of you, I wanna thank those of you in our church that have given to our camp fund. We had a goal of re raising $3 million to, to really lower the cost of camps and send more students, and we've, we've met that goal. So if you've given to that, thank you so much. This is possible because we have a church that invests in the next generation. This weekend is Father's Day, and I wanna say a special uh, just shout out to all the great dads we have. Happy Father's Day to you. Um, I wanna remind all the dads out there that you, you don't have to be a perfect dad to be a great dad. Um, I am far from a perfect dad, but to be a great dad, all we need to do is dads. I'm telling you, the most important thing we can do is, is to point our kids to the only perfect person, and that is Jesus. And this weekend, we, we've invited someone that is gonna help point all of us to Jesus. His name is Daryl Strawberry. If you don't know who Daryl Strawberry is, uh, he's, he's probably best known as a Major League Baseball player that uh, won multiple championships playing for the Mets and the Yankees. He was an eight-time All-Star. He was an epic player on the field. But what I think makes Daryl's story so special isn't what happened on the baseball field, it's what happened off the field. Off the field, Daryl's life fell apart as he turned to drugs and, and other just devastating things. But Daryl turned to Jesus in the midst of all of his mess, and Jesus transformed his life. And I think God has someone here today so he can transform yours. Get ready to be inspired. Would you help me give a huge welcome to Daryl Strawberry? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Ashley, uh, Travis, Pastor Travis, and good to be with you today. CCV, what a church, what a church. Give yourself a hand, come on. It's, 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 it's nothing greater than coming in a church that's thriving. You know, I, I love that because this is what our life is really all about. It's about the body of Christ being who God called us to be. And when you have a good church, good pastor, good staff, good team, good security, man, you should be running the church. <laughs> it's like, I gotta get there, because God's got something for me. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Father, we love you, honor you, praise you. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you that you give us strength when we don't even know it. We thank you that you allow us to be overcomers. And Father, we don't have to sit in the victim role of saying someone done something to me. God, you have done something great inside of all of us. I pray that someone that's here today will be touched by the words. Let the words of my mouth be accepted in your sight, Father, and let it speak to the hearts of the people today. Do what only you can do. We give you honor and glory in advance for what you're about to do. And we magnify your wonderful name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's, it's, it's okay to say amen. <laughs> but see, I love it. I love it so much because, see, I wasn't always like this either. You know, and I was, you know, this liar, cheater, womanizer, alcoholic, drug addict, sinner, rich, famous, lived behind community gates, had it all but had nothing. Just accumulated a lot of earthly things and, you know, we think people will have it all together because we see their wealth and their fame and they truly have it all together. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that's not the case. That's not, that's not how this game of life works. And the reason why I say that because I was broken and I grew up in a dysfunctional home. My dad was a raging alcoholic. He came home for the last time when I was about 14, drunk again, and pulled out a shotgun and said he was going to kill the whole family. 
My dad used to beat us and reject us. So me and my brothers came this close to killing him tonight. Had it not been for my mother getting us out of the house, we would have killed him. And it could have been a tragedy in my life before I ever put a uniform on. So what am I saying? I was already broken before I ever put the uniform on. See, brokenness is real. Lawlessness brings about brokenness. It brings broken situations and you continue to stay broke, broken in your life until you actually get a transformation to be changed. See, I grew up, I grew up with all these expectations, you know, for myself because I didn't have a male figure in my life. And I just remember in high school when I was playing high school baseball in the 10th grade year, I just remember the fact that I came running off the field one day and then I walked half of the other way and my coach came up to me and he thumped me in the head and said, don't you ever walk off this field again. I took the uniform off and threw it in his face and quit. Why? Because I was broken. I had issues, struggles. And the reality is, you know, issues are real. And that happened to me in high school, and then I go on to go back in the next couple of years, and then my senior year, I come out to play baseball. My first day on the baseball field after playing basketball, there was scouts, major league scouts everywhere to look at me. I go 0 for 4 and strike out three times. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was hilarious, you know, you know because you know, I, here it is, they're coming to see me and saying, well, this kid is the black Ted Williams and he's gonna be the next this. And, you know, 18 years old in high school. And I would go on to do well and finish up in that year and the draft would come and I would end up being the first pick in the draft in 1980 by the New York Mets. They come and get me out of class and they says, you've been drafted. I says, okay. <laughs> they say, no, you don't understand. You're the number one pick. I says, okay. It says, you're going, been drafted by the New York Mets, you're going to be playing in New York. I said, where the heck is New York at? <laughs> <laughs> you see, I was a Southern California player, you know, and I came from Southern California and I grew up as a fan of baseball and I grew up, you know, in the days of watching the Cincinnati Reds and the LA Dodgers and watching, my favorite player was Pete Rose, you know, Mr. Charlie Hustle. You know, I got a lot, yeah, a lot of these young people don't know who Pete Rose is, but. <laughs> But I, I saw him play and then I thought, man, I just want to be just like that guy. And why would I want to be like him? Because he was a baseball player and his uniform was dirty. And that's what a baseball player looks like, with a dirty uniform. Because if your uniform clean and you're just keeping it clean, you, you're not doing nothing on the field. <laughs> so I just go on and end up playing in the minor leagues. And I realized one thing after my high school of quitting, I realized that I would never quit again. And I came this close to quitting in Lynchburg, Virginia, in A-ball. And the Mets asked me to give it another year. And I decided to give it another year to play and went to Jackson, Mississippi and played double A. And then I would become the MVP of the double A year. And I was, became a ball player. I arrived and became a ball player. And then I go to triple A the next year and I stay one month in triple A. And there I was in the big leagues at the age of 21. See, I gotta set this story up for you so you can understand the importance of this. You know, during all this time of putting on the uniform and playing, I was never well on the inside. And a lot of us can make ourselves believe that we're well because we accumulate all these things, fame, fortune, and money, and stuff like that, and we cover it up and make us look like we're well. But I always say that my pain led me to my greatness, and my greatness would eventually lead me to my destructive behavior. And when I look back and realizing getting to the big leagues and I wanted to be a part of it and I wanted to fit in. So my first road trip, a veteran player introduced me and he said, go back to the back of the plane in the bathroom. And there it was, they introduced me to cocaine at the age of 21. And I wanted to fit in, I just wanted to be a part because my dad said I would never be a part of anything. And these guys would welcome me in and I went back there and hit it and I liked it. And then they took me out that night to the club and they showed me the life the club, the girls, the drinking, and I'll talk to myself, no, I have arrived. Little did I know that that, that would cost me uh, in my life with the destructive behavior. But I just remember one thing that I did with younger players because I was broken and those guys showed me all the wrong way. I remember when younger players came up and I was like rich and you know, I had all kind of money, I would never take them to the club. I, I would take them out and buy them clothes. <laughs> 
I didn't want them to pick up the bad habits that I learned. I didn't want anybody else to fall through the cracks like I did. Because it's easy to fall through the cracks. It's easy to follow the crowd. And when I played at the major league level and was very successful, there were only two players on my team that I ever saw live right. Mookie Wilson and Gary Carter. The rest of us was a bunch of heathens. A life fast and moving, and everybody tells you yes, nobody ever tell you no, you do what you want, you got all kind of money, nobody cares. You know, that's the life it is. Gary Carter was a great example of what a man is supposed to look like and live like. He loved his family, he loved his kids, and he was drinking milk. <laughs> I wish I could have been drinking milk at that time too, but I wasn't drinking milk and I got into all the wrong things, and it nearly cost my life. And I just remember when I got saved, I remember when I became a free agent, I signed a $20 million contract, the biggest contract of my life, and I went to LA, and I got saved that first year, 1991. I remember going to a crusade, more surreal crusade in Anaheim, and I remember, just like being here in the church, and I remember for the first time, all I was hearing was about Jesus. I was there for four nights. I remember Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I was there for that whole weekend, and all I did the whole weekend was cry. And I wonder people were probably thinking, well, what is he crying for? He's got all this money, he's famous. He's made eight all-stars, I mean, I mean seven at that time, but I was gonna make an eight one. He's won championships, you know, rookie of the year, what is wrong, you know? But when I heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was something that was touching me down in my spirit that was telling me that I needed to have a relationship with Jesus. Because I had every earthly thing, but I didn't have anything inside. Like most of us, we'll accumulate all this earthly stuff, but we don't have the freedom of who Jesus is on the inside. And I experienced that at that weekend, and I came down Sunday and I got saved. And then I remember I got saved, and the first thing happened to me was I ran into the wall at Dodger Stadium and dislocated my shoulder. But they padded the wall the next day. They were a little day late, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember to myself, I got saved, but I didn't get discipled. And I ran into the wall, dislocated my shoulder, and I was out. And I was the top vote getter in the All-Star that year, and I, I, didn't even, I didn't even play the first half of the season. And I just remember not having a foundation and being discipled through the Word of God. I just remember after I ran into that wall and was out, I went back out, started womanizing again, drugging again, and I was out for maybe another 15 years and almost losing my life. I ended up in the Florida State Prison with a T17169 for addiction. I ended up with cancer twice, losing my left kidney in the second surgery. But God is still the miracle maker. God still has a plan. No matter what it may look like in the natural, what I love about God is he's not in the natural, he's in the supernatural. See, he's on a different plan than what we are. We operate in the natural of who we are and the stuff that we achieve, and, and, and we hold on to that. And I, you know, I, I could hold on to all that, trophies, and you know, I've been on the, I was on the cover of Sports Illustrated seven times, the cover of Sports Illustrated when I was playing. But what does it all mean at the end of the day? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Father's Day weekend, what does it really all mean? When you look at King Solomon, he talks about it in the book of Ecclesiastes. He talks about the fact that it is meaningless under the sun without God. What is he saying? He said it means nothing because King Solomon was the richest, wisest man in Jerusalem and had it all, had everything. He writes the book of Proverbs of wisdom and knowledge. And then he goes right back and writes this book here, I believe. You know, I don't know when, but I'm just saying. Ecclesiastes, and he's telling us it's meaningless under the sun 
without God. So what is he saying? He turned away from God's ways and went into his own ways doing what he wanted to do, just like most of us, like I did. But it wasn't until I came back and come to the place of repenting to God and asking God to forgive me. It was a long process, but eventually I would come back. How did I get back? My wife, Tracy, today led me back to the Lord. I was $3 million in debt, shooting dope, smoking crack, wanting to die in South Florida. She's banging on doors, kicking doors up, bringing me out and saying, God's got a plan for you. I says, why don't you and that God just leave me here and let me die? She goes, you're just not that lucky. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> At, amen. <laughs> See, because for fathers today, you know, our, our fathers, I want to be able to say this. That woman that God gives to us is the greatest gift. Sometimes we don't realize, we don't want to realize it because our ego won't let us. But she's the greatest gift that God gives to us. That's the helpmate that he has provided for us to have. Because we'd be like, oh, I got it all together. I know everything. No, you don't. <laughs> we need the helpmate. My wife made my life better made me the man that I am today because of her. And I'm not afraid to say it because she's the gift that God gives to us to make us better. Because they help us see things that we don't see. And Tracy ended up leading me back to the Lord and I would go on this journey of coming back to the Lord. And it, it didn't happen overnight. You know, she's Dr. Tracy, she's got masters and she's got all these degrees and everything. She's smart as ever, I'm nowhere close to that. And I used to be saying, God, why are you always talking to her? <laughs> and God told me one day, well, because she spends time with me. She gets up at 5.30 every morning, since we've been together for 23 years, she gets up at 5.30 every morning to go study the Word of God. I was like, God, I'm not getting up at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> he said, well, you're gonna need to spend some time with me if you wanna get where I need to take you. And eventually I did, I went, started hiding out with God, and got discipled and saturated myself in the word. And there it was, God revealed himself to me. God reveals himself to you through the word. Coming to church, being discipled, hearing the word, taking notes, and going home and chewing on it. If you chew on it, God's gonna develop you inside into something that you can't not even imagine. A man that's not even qualified to preach the gospel, God calls me out of a pit and put me in a poor pit and says, you're gonna preach the gospel. I goes, I don't wanna preach the gospel. Because you know why I didn't wanna preach the gospel? Because I know one thing, getting in this poor pit is nothing to play with. I don't wanna be a hypocrite no more talking about Jesus, but not living for Jesus. Straddle on the fence, talking about Jesus, talking about his name, but denying his power. Because his power is great in what he has done. At the cross of Calvary, him shedding his blood for us, and then going to the tomb, and then getting up early Sunday morning with all power in his hand for me and for you. Nobody else will do that for you. Nobody else will do that for you. Nobody. Not your husband, not your wife, not kids, not money. Nobody will do that for you but Jesus. He's already done it for us. See, what we don't understand in the natural, Jesus already paid the price so that we can have an abundant life. And Jesus talks about it in John 10, 10. He talks about, he says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, I have come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. You know what that means? He's talking about joy, peace, wisdom, knowledge, power. He's talking something far greater than anything that we would be able to achieve from a material thing or anything. He's talking about, I'm gonna give you something that you don't even 
know about. It's going to blow your mind how, what he's going to give you. Why? Because it's good. Why? Because it's rich. Why? Because it comes out of the book. Why? Because the book has been here forever. Heaven and earth going to pass away, but not my word. The word of God is not going to pass away. God loves broken people. Matter of fact, he, Jesus loved hanging out with the sinners and the lost because those that ha think they have it all together and they can never reach this place with Jesus because it's a very pinnacle place with him when you can come and say that I need the Savior in my life. I need this kind of relationship. I need to walk like this. You know, you don't have to live according to your flesh anymore when you come to have a personal relationship with Jesus and you walk with Jesus. You don't have to live in your flesh and talk about, well, I need this, I need that. No, the only thing I need is to get up every day and worship God. I love it. I, love, I, remember, when, I remember when I first went on this journey with God, I was sleeping in the bed with two Bibles. You know why? Because I was so hungry. And I needed to taste and see that the Lord is really good. I needed to stop. I needed to stop eating that Burger King and start eating steak. <laughs> this is real meat here. This is real knowledge. This is real freedom. What God has been trying to give to all of us, his people, but we live in a time that's divided and it's falling apart and broken. And we live in a time where social media and, and internets and all that other stuff is important. We live in a time where, you know, it's about CNN and Fox and all that is garbage. This book is going to show you who you are. It's the blueprint of life. I don't know where we've been, went wrong with being told that it's weak to serve God. The devil is a liar. It is great to serve God. God takes your life and takes the broken pieces and he puts them back together for good. God called me 15 years ago to preach the gospel. Didn't go to school, nothing wrong with that because when you think about Saul, he turns him into the Apostle Paul, knocks him off a horse, and blinds him for three days and three nights on his way to Damascus Road. And Paul, Saul wasn't a hero. Ananias was the hero when you read that text. Ananias was a man that God gave a vision to see him and go lay hands on him because he was the chosen vessel. And then God will save him and turn him in to the Apostle Paul. He was an educated man, and he was a Christian killer. So what do you think God would do with you, with you? Just what I thought. Just what I thought he would do with me. I, I was like, there's no way you can use me. Don't you know what I used to do? He's like, yeah, you're the perfect one. You're the perfect one that needs the Savior, so I can use you and transform you, and you can go there. You can go back out and tell everybody how good I am. Why? Because he rescues and he redeems and he restores. He rescues you from your sinful ways. He redeems you with his blood and he restores you with his grace. That's what he do. He's in the business of rescuing, and redeeming, and restoring people that are willing to get rid of their egos, especially a man. He gets rid of his ego, which is a three-letter word, easing God out. When a man can get rid of his ego and walk with humility with God, God will exalt you right in front of everybody else. All those that were talking about me and laughing about me, the players I played with, they still point fingers and laughing. Oh, yeah. They were talking about me when I was a heathen. Now they're talking about me because I love Jesus. Just get over there. They're going to talk about you anyway. <laughs> but I love the fact that they're talking about me because I love Jesus. Because what they see is that I've been set free. 
and I'm an overcomer from all the worldly things. I'm not famous. I'm just a sinner been saved by grace, and I love Jesus. And hopefully this message today will touch somebody else, and you'll make a commitment to Jesus too, and he'll use you mightily for his great work because it is really good when you operate in him. You no longer have to be in the flesh of who you are anymore, and you get to do some incredible things because God has set it up for you to do his work. And you know what his work is all about? God's work is about people, loving people, people loving people. This is what he teaches us through the word. We can't, we, we, we can't, we got to get off these 1-800 hotline. This should be your hotline right here. This book. This should be the place you should run to. I tell people, tell Christians, stop running from God and run to God. Because if you run to God, he will do something incredible in your life and it will change you forever. It will change the way you think. It will change the way you see. Now you'll be able to see the grace in Jesus' eyes. You'll be able to see Jesus hanging on the cross at Calvary. And when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? But his last words on the cross for every last one of us, he said, it is finished. He's done it for you and for me. Now we get to walk it out and we get to help somebody else. Man, the church is awesome. So many people miss out on the church because they're too busy with everything else instead of the church. Why well, we're too busy, oh, my kids gotta play ball on Sunday. Well, your kids should be in church on Sunday. Fathers, you need to get your kids in church on Sunday because the devil's busy. This is no joke. He is busy. Busy like never before. We got kids going into school killing kids. The devil is busy. I don't know when it's going, it could happen anywhere, but I do know one thing. If I'm somewhere and something happened and my life is taken like that, I do know one thing. I'm going home. These are the times that we're living in. Get your kids in church so they can get the biblical principles in their life. So they won't be lost in social media and, and who likes them and don't like them. <laughs> I'd be laughing about that. And kids be like, well, you just don't understand. I said, well, they say, you have a lot of followers. I said, yeah, but they don't know me. We just follow people just to follow them. But I don't know people, you know, you don't know. But the message that we need to carry for others is no matter how far you go down, God still loves you. Crazy about you. My wife is so incredible. My mother is so incredible. God got a great sense of humor. Because I was a womanizer. So he puts two women in my life to straighten me out. <laughs> I just love him when you get to know him. You know, he just, I mean, he, he just, he does some things in your life that you could never imagine. And he shows them to you. My mother was praying for me while she was dying. She was praying that God would save me. She wasn't concerned about Daryl Strawberry, Major League Baseball player, living behind community gates. She was like, I'm not impressed with that. I used to come in her house with a hat on. She's like, boy, you better take that hat off before I knock it off your head. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't impressed with all that. She was praying and saying, God, give him salvation, save him. See, she died and crossed over, and she didn't get to see me in the natural but she's watching from heaven in the supernatural. And she's probably laughing. Because you know what she told me? She said, told me before she died, she said, you're going to go through it and God's going to get it out of you. 
Well, there you go right there. Mama don't lie. Because I did go through it, and God got it out of me. And he brought me to a, a wonderful place to be able to know the importance of living. The enemy purpose is to deceive you, steal your identity so you do not know who you are, kill your purpose so you do not know why you exist, destroy your mission so you do not know what to do. See, why we're sleeping, the enemy's doing push-ups, seeing who he's gonna destroy while we're sleeping. He's 24-7, so as a Christian, you gotta be 24-7 in this here, to be able to beat him and have victory over him. You'll never get victory over him. You'll think you have victory over him. He'll come back, he'll come back around this way. He'll wait and he'll come back around, he'll hit you in the back of the head, bam. Because life brings about storms. Have, have, have anybody ever been in a storm? You either in a storm, a storm's on the way, or you coming out of a storm. Because the storms are real. But when you have a foundation with Christ, guess what? You don't drown in the storm because your hope is not in the situation. Your hope is in the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Jesus' purpose is for us to have peace. He says, I want to give you great peace that surpasses all understanding so you can have the clarity and understand, understanding that you can get through anything. Anything. I mean, I, I, I love it because I get through everything. Because, like, nobody calls me anymore because I don't live the lifestyle that I used to live. So they don't, the players I play with, they don't really want to talk to me anymore. They see me at the reunions, they'd be like, they may, they'd be like, man, you're a preacher. I'll be like, it's not me, it's the great one that lives inside of me that preaches. All I do is show up and live according to the biblical principles. And when you live according to the biblical principles, you're gonna get something great from God. It's not that I have a handout from God. I don't want anything from God. I don't want money or anything from God. God, does, God doesn't have to give me anything anymore. He's gave me everything that I always wanted is salvation and freedom. I don't need anything else from God. His love is there forever. He'll never leave you nor forsake you while everybody else is gone. God will always be there. Always. And I'm forever grateful for that. Because it all works together for the good. All that I talked about in my story and the mess that I was in, guess what? The Lord cleaned it all up. Three million in debt. He cleaned up the debt and multiplied me and Tracy and gave us a ministry and he gave me more than I was in debt for obeying him. I didn't want anything, but I learned to obey the biblical principles and learn to live by them and learn to tithe, learn to give my money. Because see, God don't need your money. God needs your heart. See, he looks at the heart of you. He don't need nothing from us. And I learned to be a cup of tithe and give to God's kingdom. And God just kept blessing me and Tracy. We don't give 10%, we give 25%. We give over and beyond. Because we know one thing, that the money doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. And he gives you favor in the land when you do his will. Because it all works together, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. See, we know that we live in his purpose now. And my hope for some of you that are here today, that you must rise up and become the man, the woman that God wants you to be. It is so cool to work for the Lord. I worked for Major League Baseball. They didn't care about me when I, when I was done. You're done. That's it. They don't care if you ever come back or not. And me personally, I played 17 years in the major leagues and I don't even like baseball. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm so busy doing kingdom work and loving on people and caring about people and, and, and not focusing on that I used to be. He's dead. He no longer lives. He has died. He has, been, he has become a new man in Christ, and he wants to fulfill the promises over his life because the promises over our life are in this book. What God promised to us will come to pass if we obey him. So I would just encourage you that are here tonight, uh, today, to stay focused on who you are in Christ, not who you are in the natural, because that's going to pass away. The day is coming for you know to be called home and this will all be over. You, you can't stay here, this is not home. I buried my mom at the age of 55. I buried my sister at 51. Cancer. And I've had cancer twice. So I know it's not staying here, so what am I preparing for? I'm preparing for the next life of crossing over. Finishing the race strong and crossing over and entering in to with God forever. Because with him, it's forever. It's everlasting. And as I close, the book of John is about believing. Jesus doing the miracles, turning water into wine, feeding the 5,000, raising Lazarus from the dead. Pulling Daryl Strawberry out of a pit, putting him in a poor pit. Miracle maker. Jesus, miracle maker. He's still making miracles. He want to make a miracle out of your life. All you got to do is trust the process and walk it out. Have faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Things not seen. Things not seen. You don't have to see them. All you have to do is have faith, and God works it out. We are a nation that needs to come back to the faith of God and the true principles of God. We have gotten away from the principles of God, and we've gotten selfish and self-centered, and we need to turn for that way, and we need to come back. We need to bring our children back to the cross so they can have a relationship with Jesus, so they can know that all things truly do work together for the Good. The miracle maker of Jesus turning water into wine. John 3, telling Nicodemus, lest one is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. John 4, telling the woman at the well about her five husbands, the one you live with now is not your husband. John 8, the woman caught in adultery, Jesus spares her, gives her grace. They want to stone her because of the law. Jesus didn't come here to destroy the law. He came here to fulfill the law. John 5, man at the pool of Bethesda, had a condition, been sitting there for 38 years. You know what I love about Jesus when he saw that man? Jesus didn't ask that man about his condition. You know why? Because Jesus knows the condition of every last one of us. You know what he asked that man? Do you want to be well? He said, sir, every time I try to get in the pool, he's not talking about the excuse. He said, do you want to be well? Eventually, the man said, yes. He says, pick up your bed and walk. Made him well like that. That's the Jesus I'm talking about. He wants to make you well. You have to trust him, and you have to trust the church. The church is amazing. Don't run from it. Run to it. Because God saw something great for you. Now, at this time, I want to be able to, the host campus pastors are going to come forward, help me bring them forward, you guys. They're going to come forward and they're going to pray for the fathers. May God be with you in this wonderful, amazing church. May you grow into who God has called you to be. God bless you guys. And thank you, and happy Father's Day. Thank you,